Bibles this evening and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 11, let me just share a, a very brief story with you. When I was um, getting ready for deputation, I had breakfast with a pastor from Mansfield, Ohio, whose uh, daughter had just returned from a missions trip to South America. I don't know where she went. I can't remember where she went in South America, but she was with her missions team and she was going from people group to people group. And a man in a particular tribe noticed that this young lady was carrying a Bible. He went up to her and through an interpreter asked if the book she was carrying was a Bible. And she said, indeed, it's a Bible. And then he said this to her. He said, do you know, I have a Bible and would you like to see it? She said, I would love to see your Bible. He went into his home and came out a few minutes later with a folded up piece of cloth, much like a handkerchief folded up into a little square. He slowly unfolded that piece of material to reveal on the inside the ripped corner of one page of God's holy word. It had a portion of scripture on one side and a portion of scripture on the other side. But that was his Bible in church family tonight. It was his most prized possession. You know, that young lady had the wonderful joy and privilege of giving him her Bible. And you can imagine how overwhelmed with joy he was when he held that Bible close to his heart, tears streaming down his face. He had been given the complete word of God. He was, he was overwhelmed with joy. But someone else had joy that day, and it was that young lady that God used to give a Bible to someone that did not have a complete Bible. And I share that story to communicate that is how we feel. Uh, we have a part in those that do not have a Bible receiving the Word of God. It's a small part, but it's a part nonetheless. I've been asked to come on board as Director of National Training, and I'll have in the translation process, I will be in the fledgling stages where I will go overseas and introduce to pastors of our stripe uh, worldview ministries with the hope and prayer that we will see many more than just eight Bible translation projects. And so we appreciate the opportunity to present our ministry. We covet your prayers as we are obviously on deputation, but more importantly than praying for us, pray for the propagation of the word of God to unreached people groups and pray for worldview ministries. And again, preacher, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Hebrews chapter 11, if you will, Hebrews chapter 11. As we come to the great hall of faith, we know that there are many facets of faith found in Hebrews chapter 11. As a diamond has many facets, so too Hebrews chapter 11 has many facets of faith. There are many things we could discuss from this chapter. We could talk about the examples of faith. We could talk about the meaning of faith. We could talk about the miracle of faith. We could talk about the power of faith. We see that a little bit in verse 33. Would you look there with me? The Bible says, who through faith. And by the way, we find those words through faith or by faith over 15 times in this chapter. And notice what it says. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, and on and on and on it goes. Now, there's no question about it, and I know that you'll agree with me about this. God receives the glory for doing those miracles, amen? But he does those miracles when? When God's people take the simple step of faith. And so this evening, there are many facets of faith we could discuss from Hebrews chapter 11. We could preach for a year's Sundays on it. But we want to look at just one facet, and that is we want to look at the manifestation of faith or the evidence of faith tonight. And look with me, if you will, at verse number one of Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says that faith has evidence it is not empty. Right? Uh, have you ever heard someone say this? Well, I have faith, but it's a very private thing. I don't like to talk, talk about it very much. Not to be unloving or unkind, but that's not Bible faith, right? Faith has evidence, it's not empty. By the way, faith has substance, it's not shallow, right? And by the way, this evidence and this substance has a name. And that name is called obedience. Uh, you can't separate faith from obedience. James tells us that faith without works, faith without action, faith without obedience is a dead faith. It's dead. But a real, living, vibrant faith produces obedience. It gives our Christian life substance and it proves and it, and it demonstrates the evidence uh, of the faith that we have inside. Now, as we look at uh, some of the evidence of faith from Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at three 
But I want you to know that some of the things that God required his people to do to obey were, were a lot of them were very challenging things. They were very challenging things. And so uh, we want to just look at uh, a few of these evidences here tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together, shall we? Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word tonight. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the bright light that they are not only in this community, but around the world as they have a, a heart for missions. Father, I pray that you'll bless our time together. Use the power of your word and the power of your spirit. Father, I, I think of these dear people who have come out on a Wednesday night. Father, many uh, haven't even gone home and, and had a bite of, of dinner yet. Father, they just came right from work. And Lord, I don't want to waste their time. And I pray that you will use us. And again, the power of your word and the power of your spirit. Father, meet with us tonight and challenge us and strengthen us and convict us and teach us. Father, we pray and we'll thank you for all this in Jesus name. Amen. I don't know if you've ever heard the story or not uh, of a sweet little elderly woman who had a unique custom. She would go out on her front porch every morning and she would shout at the top of her lungs, praise the Lord. She would do this every day. Well, a neighbor moved in next door that was an atheist. And this atheist despised this woman's tradition. And so every morning, this woman, this sweet, godly woman, this uh, senior saint, if you will, she would come out on her front porch and she would shout at the top of her lungs, praise the Lord. And then this atheist would growl back, there ain't no Lord. This went on day in and day out. Well, one day, as the story goes, this lady fell on some hard times and she ran out of groceries. She went out on her front porch, as was her custom, and she started her day with a hearty praise the Lord. And then she audibly broke into prayer and said something like this. Dear God, you know, I need groceries. I ask you to provide and I'll thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Amen. The next day she woke up, went out on her front porch. Lo and behold, three bags of groceries. She was pretty excited. I would be, too. She started jumping up and down, shouting, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And then that atheist, about the third praise the Lord, jumped out from behind a bush. And he said, aha, I got you this time. I bought those groceries for you. There isn't no Lord. There ain't no Lord. She got even more excited. She started jumping up and down even more and, and, and shouting even louder. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then she said this. She said, dear God, thank you for providing the groceries for me and even making the devil pay for them. Amen. Now, I know that you know this, that uh, the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is what? It's belief. And if you're here tonight and you're saved, you've taken the greatest step of faith you'll ever take. Uh, the step of putting your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone to save you for all eternity. But just because you've done that doesn't mean that you're through with faith. I'm not teaching that salvation is a progressive thing. The Bible certainly plainly, clearly teaches that salvation is a one-time event, a one-time act. But Jesus talked about the life of faith. Jesus talked about different levels of faith. He talked about those with no faith, those with little faith, those with great faith. And that tells me that no matter where I am in the level of faith, my faith, are you ready for this? My faith can increase. My faith can strengthen. As we look at some of the examples of faith from Hebrews 11, we see that God required some pretty challenging things from them. I want to ask you a question before we look at some of these evidences, and we're going to be very brief tonight, I promise. But what is it that you know without a shadow of a doubt God wants you to do, and yet it's difficult for you to do? It would take some faith. Let me say that again. What is it that you know without a shadow of a doubt God wants you to do, and yet it's difficult for you to do? It would take some faith. Maybe for someone, it's to get baptized. Maybe for another, it's to join the church. Maybe for someone, it's to get involved with the ministry of the church. You say, Brother Bill, I I've known for, for quite some time, God wants me to get involved with the ministry at Independent Baptist Church, and I have a thousand and one reasons why I don't want to do it. It would take some faith. Maybe it's to forgive someone. I believe that one of the great sins of the church today is bitterness. Someone at some time did something to you. It may have been 30 years ago and you still haven't let go and let God. You haven't forgiven. And maybe that difficult thing for, for you to do that you know God wants you to do is to forgive. Maybe it's to witness to a, a difficult person. Maybe it's to surrender your life to missions. Maybe it's... 
uh, to give to missions in the upcoming year. I know you, I believe you just had your missions conference and, and, and maybe you say, Brother Bill, I, I, know, I know what God wants me to give for missions and boy, for me to write that check, boy, that would take some faith. And I don't know what it is, but let me ask it again. What do you know without a shadow of a doubt God wants you to do and yet it's difficult for you to do? It would take some faith. With that in mind, let me quickly, just from this text, um, look at three evidences of faith from some individuals in this text. Let's get right to it. Number one, if you're taking notes, according to Hebrews chapter 11, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not logical. I'll say that again. That, That may sound a little heretical to you, but hear me out before you throw a hymn book at me, okay? What I'm simply trying to say is this. Sometimes when God tells you to do something in your mind, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't seem or appear logical. God, you want me to forgive them? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, God says we are to forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. Let me, let me look at a Bible illustration. Look with me at verse number 7. Verse number 7. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things, what does it say? Not seen as yet. What does that mean? Noah built an ark. Okay, what's an ark? Uh, we, we would say, no, an ark is something you need when there's a flood. And Noah would say, what's a flood? And we would say, no, a flood is something that takes place when there's a lot of rain. And Noah would say, well, what's rain? You get the picture, right? Sometimes faith is just simply taking the step of obedience even though we don't have it all figured out upstairs. I'll give you a more modern day illustration. Uh, How about this? Tithing or giving. You say, I'd rather build an ark than talk about giving. I understand that, but hear me out. Do you remember the first time that someone introduced to you the topic of giving to the Lord? It made no sense whatsoever. This is what we thought. This is what you thought. This is what I thought. If the very first check I write when I get paid is to God, at the end of the month, I won't have any money left over for this, that, or the other. And guess what? On paper, you'd be absolutely correct. But you've just thrown faith right out the window. And all over the sanctuary tonight, we could have testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of Christians, believers, that could stand and say this, even though I didn't quite understand it at the time, when I trusted God with my finances, God has blessed my finances ever since. Amen? Even though at the time it didn't make all the sense in the world. Sometimes faith is just simply taking the step of obedience, even though we don't have it all figured out in our mind. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it doesn't seem logical. Number two, here's another uh, observation about the evidence of faith from Hebrews 11. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. Sometimes faith is obeying when it's not logical, but sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. Look at verse number 17, if you will. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Can you imagine that? Wow. Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him as a, as a sacrifice, offer him as a burnt offering. I couldn't even imagine that. I can't fathom that. You talk about uncomfortable. Yes, sometimes faith is taking the step of obedience, even though it's a little bit uncomfortable. I I remember hearing a story one time when I was a a children's pastor about a family that had a horrible house fire. Everyone escaped to the front yard except the little boy. He was maybe four or five years of age. He was in the upstairs window and uh, the family all got to the the, the front yard. They they look up, the the little boy's in the upstairs window and he's he's yelling to the dad. And the dad says, son, jump and I'll catch you. The little boy said, daddy, I can't jump because I can't see you. The smoke was pouring out of that window. The little boy. The father said to the little boy, he said, son, you may not be able to see me, but I can see you jump and you'll be saved. And the, and the little boy jumped and he was saved. You say, what, what, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Here's the point. Sometimes, sometimes, and I know you know this to be true. Sometimes our step of faith feels like a big old leap in the dark. It's uncomfortable. Now, I'm so thankful God doesn't require a leap in the dark. He gives us the light of his word. He gives us these examples. But sometimes doing what is not comfortable is a challenge. I think we all know this to be true. Maybe you were just newly saved. And you remember the first time preacher stood up and said, who would like to share a testimony? And you were scared to death. 
But God told you to give a testimony. Maybe it was an answer to prayer. Maybe it was something you read in the Bible. And your hands started to perspire. Your mouth got real dry. Your, your heart just was, you just thought it was going to come right out of your chest. It's beating so hard. And yet you stood and gave a testimony. Why? Because God told you to do it. Maybe you remember the first time you wrote that check to the Lord. Maybe you remember the first time you handed out that gospel track. Maybe you remember the first time you witnessed to a neighbor. Maybe you remember the first time that you did, had a special in church or sang in church. Hey, maybe you remember the first Sunday school you, class you had. Maybe there was only five children, but it felt like 500. You were scared to death. What's my point? My point is, according to Hebrews 11, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. By the way, I think this is an important question. When's the last time we've been uncomfortable? I think we get to a certain point in our Christian life and, and, and we just kind of coast and, and we stop doing those uncomfortable things that God starts impressing upon our heart to, to do. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. Number three, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not desirable. Sometimes faith is just taking the step of obedience when it's not logical or it doesn't make sense in our mind. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. And sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not desirable. We just don't want to. We just kind of fold our arms and we say, uh-uh. Instead of hardening or, or humbling our heart, we harden our heart. We stiffen our neck and we say, uh-uh. I just don't want to do it. Brother Bill Give us an illustration from Hebrews 11 about this. Every person in the great hall of faith is an example of this. Do you know why? Because they have something we all have. It's called a will. And when God the Father told them to do something, they had a choice. They had a decision. They could say yes. They could say no. But mark it down. They wouldn't be in the hall of faith if they didn't learn to say not my will but thine be done. They wouldn't be in the hall of faith if they didn't learn to kick self off the throne of their heart and put the sovereign or the savior there where he rightly deserves to be. And that's where you and I are every moment of every day. That's really, I believe, one of the great keys to the Christian life is just doing what the savior wants and not what self wants. Sometimes faith is obeying God even when it's not desirable. I'm so thankful, and, and many of you know this, that when we obey, even sometimes when we don't want to, God in time, amen, God in time changes our want to. Isn't that great? We, we just yield our will to his, and the peace and the joy flood in. Forgive me for using the Fennel family as an illustration of faith. I would love to stand before you as the poster child of faith, and it's just not the case. You'll hear why in a minute. When God started to work in my life about being a missionary, I must confess to you I didn't want to do it. In my mind, are you ready? Here it is. It wasn't logical, comfortable, or desirable. First of all, it wasn't logical for me to resign from a church I think I could have retired from. That didn't make any sense to me. People ask me uh, throughout the 15 years I was there, you know, uh, you know, have you ever considered this? Have you ever considered that? And my, my, my answer was always, I'm going to retire from Mount Vernon Baptist Temple. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be here forever. So it didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. It wasn't comfortable. I already shared with you how we love our church family so very much. And um, I think every pastor believes that he has the privilege of pastoring the greatest people in all the world. I certainly felt that way. And boy, that was uncomfortable to say goodbye to a loving church family. It was also uncomfortable financially. Um, here I am, age 47 at the time. I'm 49 now. And I have a family of seven. And at the time, I had a boy in college. And here I am, jumping into deputation for the first time in my life. I got to tell you, I was scared to death. I remember the last paycheck that I received, Pastor, from Mount Vernon Baptist Temple, knowing that in two weeks I'm jumping into deputation for the first time. I was absolutely petrified. I, in my mind, there was no way this was going to pan out. There was no way this was going to work. I, I remember looking at young missionaries right out of college. They didn't have a mortgage and all of the things that came with it. And I had all of that. And I thought to myself, I'm doing, the, I'm doing the dumbest thing I could ever do. There's no way this is going to fly. I'm going to go bankrupt in three months. Scared to death. It wasn't comfortable. 
It wasn't comfortable. And then number three, for many weeks, it was not desirable. Uh, I remember having um, discussions with the Lord, and, and no doubt you've had arguments with the Lord. You know, you can't argue with the Lord, right? How many of you know that? You just can't argue with the Lord. And so um, I would talk with the Lord, and I would, I would have conversations like this. God, you know my heart, and you know I don't want to do this, but I will pastor another church if you want me to. I don't want to, but I will if you want me to. And God said, that's not what I have for you. I remember thinking, um, God, I, I, I don't really want to do this, but if there's a Bible college out there that will uh, have me do something for them, I, I would be willing to do that, though I don't want to do that. And God said, that's not what I have for you. I remember even thinking this, and uh, I think preachers understand what I'm about to say. I remember thinking, God, I don't want to do this, but I will be a church planting missionary where at least I can be a pastor. God said, that's not what I have for you. He said, there's almost 4,000 people groups that don't have a Bible. I want you to go from church to church and raise awareness and represent those that do not have a Bible. And I remember the day that I was sitting in my office and the Lord made it very clear what what he wanted me to do. I was sitting in my office and and uh, I received an email from one of our, our missionaries that we support, our Mount Vernon Baptist Temple supported to the Philippines. And he put at the end of his prayer letter, his newsletter, I have it written in my, at the beginning of my Bible here. But it was like he wrote it just for me. This is what he said. If you are considering God's calling to foreign missions, do not fear. He said, we can boldly say with the Apostle Paul, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. I remember tears streaming down my face. I remember thinking, okay, God, I get the picture. I'll do it. And, and I took that step. That step felt like a big old leap. But we made that step. And here's the point. It's not about us. It's about God. God has is, God is blessed every step of the way. God has, stepped, God has blessed every step of the way. Every bill has been paid. Uh, every need provided. We have never gone without Every step of the way, we just finished the three-year mark, three year mark of deputation, uh, and, um, and God has just blessed every step of the way. To God be the glory. And God tells us that he will do that. In closing, look at verse number six of our text, and we'll, we'll close and turn this over to preacher, but look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number six. It shouldn't surprise us that God blesses us when we do what he tells us to do, Right? It shouldn't surprise us that God blesses when we obey and are faithful to do what he's called us to do. Verse number six, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The TV evangelists will tell you that that is some sort of cotton candy Christianity, some sort of prosperity gospel where if you have enough faith, you'll never be sick. You'll have a million dollars in the bank. That's just not the case. All verse number six is teaching is this. God is pleased when his children do what he tells them to do. When we take the step of faith, the the step of obedience. Verse number six has many applications, one application that has meant something very near and dear to the Fennel family in this transition from pastor to missionary is this, that God can bless us better than we can bless ourselves. Do you know that to be true? Do you know that to be true? God can bless you better than you can bless yourself. God can bless me better than I can bless myself. But I need to be in the place of blessing. I need to be found faithful. I need to be obedient doing what he's called me to do. Years ago, we were having dinner around the kitchen table on a Saturday night, and uh, my third son, Chad, interrupted Amy and I. We're at the table having dinner, and my third son, just about this tall at the time, he interrupts Amy and I, and he says, Daddy, may I have some potato chips? There was a bag of potato chips on the table, and I said, Sure, go ahead. And I kept talking to Amy, and I didn't know this, but he didn't take any. So a few minutes later, he interrupts again, and he says, "Uh, Daddy, may I have some potato chips? I looked at him, and I said, sure, go ahead. And I turned, and I kept talking to Amy, and I didn't know this, but he didn't take any. Now, he interrupted a third time. 
Now, if you're a father out there, you know we only have so much patience, right? I mean, that's the way God made us. We, I mean, you get to a certain point, you just run out of patience. And so he interrupted a third time. And by the third time he's interrupting, you know, as a, as a father, you start having evil thoughts, right? Like I'm going to feed him a, a potato chip with a slingshot if he doesn't stop interrupting me. These are the, the evil thoughts that you have. And, and so he interrupted a third time. And, and I, I remember looking at him like, what? And he said, Daddy, may I have some potato chips? I said, yes, son, take some potato chips. And I moved the bag over right in front of his chubby little face at the table. I said, take some potato chips. And this is what he said to me. We'll close with this. He said, no, daddy, you do it. He said, your hand is bigger than my hand. And I remember thinking, you know what? (laughs) My father's hand's a lot bigger than my hand. God can bless me a whole lot better than I can bless myself. My father's hand's a lot bigger, but I just need to be found faithful. I just need to be doing what he, he's telling me to do. You look at the people in the, in the great hall of faith. God required some challenging things of them. When's the last time you've been challenged? I, I end where we began. What is it that you know without a shadow of a doubt God wants you to do, and yet it's, it's difficult for you to do? It would take some faith. May God give us the humility and the courage to do what he's telling us to do. Our-